plane and the rules are that you can't put a name on that airplane unless that person has actually flown that airplane. Uh, so we had to go through, jump through the hoops and, uh, and we got it done and that's led to this today. Uh, it might surprise you to know that most uh, combat airplanes you see in air museums uh, or on the air show circuit have never actually flown in combat. They're representative of combat airplanes. But this Crusader uh, has a glorious combat history. It flew many hours over the, uh, the hostile skies of North Vietnam. Uh, if you look closely at the painting, uh, the paint job on the airplane, it's painted in the, in the markings of Fighter Squadron 162 uh, and the carrier Oriskany. And, uh, and that's where it was back in the 60s. Uh, and the name on the cockpit, Lieutenant G.G. Rick Adams flew that airplane, that airplane, many times over North Vietnam. Um, so it's an honor for me today to introduce to you Rick, who's here to talk about his experiences over North Vietnam. Uh, and uh, what, what wasn't put out in the press releases and, and so on uh, about Rick's experience uh, was that while he was over there, he was shot down twice uh, in Crusaders, obviously not that one. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, what also I, I don't think was in the releases after, uh, after his combat tour in Vietnam, he became a member of Blue Angels. So it's, uh, it's an honor to introduce to you uh, one of the most decorated pilots to come back from Vietnam, a genuine genuine war hero, then Lieutenant Junior Grade Rick Adams, now Commander, retired Rick Adams. It is a thrill to, to be uh, here with my airplane. This is sort of a surprise thing that Al helped put together and, uh, and it's exciting. Uh, hidden in that introduction, I wish it was hidden a little deeper, uh, was that I was shot down twice. And, you know, that's, and actually you count the flight attendant in Atlanta three times. Uh, but, but, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, uh, dubious distinction at best, but there's sometimes a lot of things can be learned from that kind of thing, being shot down. Uh, I'm in uh, Tampa, Florida, giving a presentation kind of like this, and I, Admiral brings up his, his son to me and says, son, I want you to meet Rick Adams. He's been shot down twice. And this kid gets us. Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. Fortunately, it was by ground fire. Some guy in the ground with a gun or, as you'll discover, with a missile. Uh, as a fighter pilot, the ultimate indignity would be shot down by another fighter. Uh, so at least I was spared that. As we go through this presentation, you'll see that there's a lot of things that came from those shoot downs besides wrecking a beautiful airplane, uh, and we'll talk about some of them. Flying the F-8 just generally, uh, what's it like to fly? It's, it's an absolutely marvelous airplane to fly. It's, it's a little difficult to land uh, and a little difficult to bring aboard the ship, uh, but a little difficult is not impossible. It just means you got to work at it. There were probably more than a share of landing accidents, uh, but if you paid attention to your business, you did just fine. It was, it was from a pilot standpoint, it felt wonderful in the cockpit. I mean, it just, it just matched. You just almost had to just think about flying the airplane. It would go where you wanted to go, light on the controls, you could pull G's, you could go a thousand miles an hour at the drop of a hat. I mean, all these things that kids dream of, that airplane can do. And it was just really fun to fly. When, we, when we're introduced to the airplane, like any, any time you're introduced to an airplane, you got to learn uh, what it can do. Uh, if it can go a thousand miles an hour, you want to go a thousand miles an hour to see what it's like. If it'll go 1,200 miles an hour, you go 1,200 miles an hour. If you fly at 150, you want to fly it at 150. If it'll go to 50,000 feet, you go to 50,000 feet. And, and as, you, as you fly the airplane more and more, your envelope that you're comfortable with in the airplane expands, and you want it to be the same size as the airplane. If the airplane can pull six Gs, you want to be able to pull six Gs. 
So as you go through flight training, each each step you take in training in the F-8, you learn more and more about it and get closer and closer to the airplane. By the time you've flown it, I think about 500 hours, which is two years of flying probably, uh, the airplane starts to really feel comfortable. Uh, and by the time you've flown it to a thousand, a thousand hours, you, you really start thinking, I mean, this airplane is mine. Uh, and unfortunately, you fly about a thousand hours and they give you another airplane. But, uh, but that's okay. It's a, a wonderful airplane to fly. And I, I enjoy flying it. I know it was Alan's favorite airplane. There were several other F-8 drivers here today. There's one was one over there a minute ago. It's, uh, every every airplane driver who's flown F-8, that's his favorite airplane. Uh, the F-4 is a great airplane, but the F-8 is, is where it's at. Uh, emergencies in airplanes happen all the time. These airplanes are complicated. And when you say emergencies, it doesn't mean the airplane's going to blow up. It means that something doesn't work like it's supposed to. So we spend a lot of time learning all the little intricacies and the systems of the airplane uh, so we can make whatever repairs, or in most cases in a single seat airplane, whatever the limitations of the airplane are, uh, we can operate inside those limitations and, and not make things worse by doing something stupid uh, when the airplane really is not prepared to do that. Uh, and it almost becomes a game uh, in in learning the emergency procedures of an airplane because you want to get really good at it because if you have an emergency, the whole world stops and watches you and your airplane. So if you're going to be center stage, you want to look good. So when you have an emergency, darn it, I want to show all these people who are watching, the crash crews on the ground, the people listening on the radio, that I know what I'm doing. Uh, there's some great stories. Gene Cernan, an astronaut who went to the moon a couple times. And so Gene comes back from, I think, his second trip to the moon. And, and he and I are having lunch and talking about the flight. And I said, so how was the flight? And he said, God, so frustrating. Frustrating. Everything went perfectly. That's the trouble. I spent three years learning how to deal with every possible emergency. <laughs> on the, he drove a little lunar tractor thing, you know, said, I learned how to fix all this stuff and I could fix the tires and do all this stuff. He says, nothing broke. <laughs> I wasted three years of my life doing all this stuff. Because he was he was comfortable and confident in his emergency procedures. He would love to have been on international television with the whole world watching while he demonstrated how to turn, but not three turns to the right uh, and have it fix something or whatever it was going to do. So you can kind of appreciate the pilot's thought, and I think, I don't know about Alan, but I know I, I like to, when I had an emergency, to make sure that I could demonstrate to the world that I could handle it right. At one time, in an F-4, flew into a flock of birds in low altitude and lost an engine and had so many birds splattered on the front windscreen that I couldn't see out the front. And out the side windows, I could see that the leading edge of the wings were all beat up like they'd been hit with a ball-peen hammer from all these birds I'd hit. And I, as I say, I have one engine, but I lost one engine. So, uh, so I'm single engine, and I can't see out the front. And it's really not a big deal. The airplane flies fine on one engine. And you don't need to look out the front. You can look out to the side and see. You've got instruments to tell you where the runway and all that stuff is. But the whole world is watching me drive around this airplane. And everyone thinks, oh my goodness, they're going to crash. And my RO and I are kind of laughing because this was kind of fun, all this attention I gave And we were making a point to be very professional. And then we said, we're going to check the airplane's slow flight characteristics. We might have to jump out of it. Uh, would you please send the helo out this vector to pick us up if we have to jump out? And of course, everyone listening to us was all horrified. And we're in the cockpit laughing. This is kind of fun. It wasn't going to happen. So you, you can kind of imagine pilots flying these complicated airplanes, having these emergencies, and then you don't want to have one and have everyone watch you and blow, sound like you don't need your So the emergency parts of the airplane are really just, are really kind of fun, challenges. Uh, flying these airplanes in combat, which is sort of why we're all here, is an interesting experience, and, and we'll go through a couple different scenarios to give you an idea of what uh, 
what it's what it's like. But the, in 1965, uh, the surface to air missile, SA-2, they call it, uh, about 35 feet long, about that diameter, whatever that is, big. It's a three-stage solid propellant rocket. Launch phase, second phase, and then the guidance phase. Uh, it's a big weapon. It's got a warhead of 250 pounds of explosives in the nose of it. The typical missile warhead that we shoot from airplane to airplane has seven or eight pounds of high explosives, and that's enough to cut an airplane in half. 250 pounds is overkill. And as young pilots going out to fly in these skies where SA-2 missiles would be fired was terrifying. I mean, what are we going to do? We have no tactics. No one's ever seen one in flight. There's no such thing as electronic countermeasures where we can uh, send out electronic spoofing signals to fool this missile. We're told to go out and fly and see what happens. So that's what we did. The first five times they shot the missile, they killed the pilot. The sixth shoot down was me. So let's go back to that time and replay that and talk about why it was different and what we learned from that day. The, the enemy fighters uh, were not much of a threat, if at all. And we spent, as fighter pilots, spent most of our time trying to find one to fight. And, and they would run off and hide in China. They'd go across the border wait till we were done flying and then come back and land at their bases. They had bases in North Vietnam with quite a few mates, but they would not engage us. So my flight leader and I had this plan to go north of the main population center along the Chinese border on the North Vietnamese side and hide up there in kind of a valley. And then when the MiGs took off to hide from one of them, from a big strike that was coming, they'd fly over the top of us and we'd shoot them. It seemed like a cool plan. Well, we're 30,000 feet over Haiphong, which is the coastal city, a big port city of, of North Vietnam. They had moved missiles into Haiphong the day before. So we sort of knew they were there. Uh, we don't have any kind of warning equipment. This is pre any of that stuff. This is just, you look around, see what you can see. And, and no one's seen a missile in flight. So no one knows what to expect. But even though they're big, Let's say an airplane that day, if it flew by, it would be kind of hard to see it. It was 10 miles away or so. So we were kind of doing what I would call a stair scan rather than moving around like this. We kind of picked the sector we thought the missile might come from. Stair. Like that. I should have stared. Because he came up on this side of me. And I'm looking over here, and there's this bright orange flash, and suddenly my quiet, smooth airplane ride became a bumpy road. And on the emergency panel, fire warning light flashes, and all the gauges that we would practice dealing with in our emergency procedures, now we're all alight, and the gauges were spinning. I look at my mirrors, we have rear mirrors on the F-8. Uh, they're not outside the air, they're inside, but it allows you to look back kind of close along the fuselage. All I can see was fire. So I roll the airplane over because there's a friendly destroyer about 15 miles off the coast and I want to fly over to the destroyer. I know I'm going to have to jump out and jump out near that destroyer because I want to be near friendly forces. Plus, the closer I am to the destroyer, the less time I'm going to spend swimming around in this water. As I roll over to look for the destroyer, I'm distracted by two more missiles coming up at me. Uh, the thing that was amazing was this giant fireball. There was no staring to see one. All you had to do was have your eyes open and be looking in that part of the world. This bright fireball just jerked your attention to you. A real attention getter, if you will. And the missiles were about a mile apart, and they were heading towards, in a position to head towards where I was going. They were, they were trying to, it's called lead pursuit. 
And so I made a turn to go someplace else. Yeah. The missile made a little, it's kind of a sluggish uh, kind of a turn and then settled down on a track. So I made one more turn and the missile didn't follow me that time and just went off on its own and exploded. Same thing with the third one. I had a couple chances to make some turns and easily avoided it. If, if you're a, in a snowball fight in Michigan, you understand this, you know, the only time you get hit with a snowball is if you're not looking at the guy tossing the snowball, right? As long as you can see the guy tossing the snowball, he won't hit you. And that may sound simplistic, but the same thing with the missile. As long as you see the missile launch, know where it's coming from, they'll never get you. The guidance system is slow enough responding that all you got to do is see it coming and literally go someplace else. Uh, and, and we were so confident with that that we're going to use that information later on. We'll talk about that. So now I'm heading down towards this destroyer. These missiles have missed me. Uh, the airplane now, because it's starting to come apart, it's kind of wiggling around a little underneath me. It doesn't feel nice and steady. But I'm afraid to let go of the controls to eject. Once I let go of the controls, I'm kind of holding the airplane in a straight line. Once I let go, the airplane is going to tumble some. So what I opted to do was keep one hand on the stick and then pull the face curtain out about four or five inches and lay it up against my forehead like this. The idea being that if the airplane came apart, uh, it's probably going to eventually. Uh, if it was tumbling wildly, I might not be able to find the face curtain. So I wanted to have the face curtain right here. The face curtain, when you pull it a little further, uh, fires a charge underneath the seat and blows you out of the airplane. It's a pretty big charge. So it'll blow you about 200 feet in the air. If the airplane was parked on the runway and you were to pull this, it'd blow you about 200 feet up on the airplane. The newer seats are better than that. But that's a pretty nice system. So you don't bail out or jump out and pull ripcord. You just pull this thing down and all the rest of it happens automatically. So I got the face curtain down. I'm heading for where I think is the destroyer. The airplane starts to wiggle a little more than I'm comfortable with. And the next thing I know, the canopy comes off and I come out of here. Uh, the airplane actually was breaking in half. So it was starting to tumble. And it's fire. And so there's a lot of fire around uh, at that point. So I come down in my parachute. Because I was going so fast, I was in the mid 400s when I came out of the airplane. That the risers from the parachute uh, didn't weren't all intact. The, the one on one side tore loose. So, uh, first, mercifully, they had an interconnect where the, the, the parachute lines that come down to the person in suspension are all hooked together. So even though one of them tore off my harness, they were all still intact. So the parachute stayed inflated. It was a little off at an angle, but but just a little bit. So I drift down, land in the water. Uh, there are three, uh, not ships, but big boats, 100 foot plus boats down there, uh, North Vietnamese boats, uh, patrol boats of some type. And I can't tell because they're, they're either pointed right at me or pointed away from me. I can't tell which. I'm just looking at silhouettes of them, either looking at me or going away. So I take out my hardy, trusty, 38 revolver, pointed their direction, and I'm going to scare them away with my big gun. Pop, pop. It's amazing how little noise a 38 revolver makes when you're trying to scare somebody. I mean, in the movies, when they shoot a, shoot a pistol, you know, one jumps up and it makes a big bang, pop, pop. It doesn't even scare me. This is ridiculous. It's like a back in my holster. I was not impressed with my firepower at all. It turns out they were going away from me and posed no threat, so that's fine. Hilo comes out from the destroyer. Uh, they see my airplane blow up, and so they come and get me, and they tell me to jump out of the raft and swim over to the sling they're going to drop. And when I jump into the water, I realize I've been burnt a bit. So my hands around my neck and stuff were singed, so that hurt quite a bit, but everything considered, I was way ahead of the game, I thought. So I get sent back to the destroyer, then we get shuttled back to the ship. And after we get back to the ship and all the guys who were on this uh, strike uh, were 
involved in getting me out of the water. We all get together and start talking. And we start talking about the uh, missiles and how the missiles tracked me, or, or correctly, did not track me. And we said, you know, guys, uh, if you see the missiles coming, you're not going to have a problem. And, and you'll see them coming. I mean, they're not, this is not a, you know, a, a difficult thing to see. Just have your eyes open and, and be looking in somewhere near where you're going to see them. So my flight leader and I were confident enough because we had dealt with three missiles already, two and a half. I, I got the whole one that he got to help. But we, we had flown around the missiles enough, so we were very comfortable. So we told the guys, here's what we're going to do. Let's put together a mission where we go out with the attack airplanes, which in the Navy, you know, there's a dichotomy between attack and fighters. Fighters are normally lightly loaded and are designed for air-to-air -air combat. The attack airplanes carry bombs and tend to be a little more sluggish because uh, they're going to go in and drop bombs on the ground. So we took the attack guys out, and the two fighters are uh, in front of them, and we're pretending to be attack airplanes. And we do a simulated attack in an area that is known to be heavily infested with SA-2 missiles. So we pitch the airplanes up to about 6,000 feet, pretending to be in a dive bombing target, but we're, we're lightly loaded and very maneuverable. And we expect to see a volley of missiles, which is three. They always figured out that they, they shoot, shot three at a time, so we expect to see three missiles. So over the horizon comes the first, and the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And, and, and you could see, I'm not sure what our visual range was, but you could see them lined up like a spray. It just went, seemed to go on and on and on. And, you know, we expect three, and we're going to do some maneuvering to get rid of these three missiles, and then not have to do it again the fourth time and the fifth time. And, and it got to be a lot of work. And, and we're obviously scared, uh, but we were, it was working. And we got all all uh, eight missiles. Uh, none of them hurt us. We were fine. Uh, the guys with all the heavy bombs uh, could see the smoke trails that went back to where the missiles were launched. And and when the missiles launched, they just kicked up this giant pile of dust and smoke. So there was there was no hiding with a location. And these guys went in with a special kind of weapon that, that a snake eye. Those of you who know the stuff is went in with snake eyes. So they could go in at low altitude and drop high explosive ordnance, low altitude, which normally you can't handle if you dropped a big bomb from low altitude. It would blow your airplane up, because it would go off right underneath you. These are bombs that are designed to go off behind you. So they dropped these snake eyes in there, uh, cleaned those missile sites out, uh, complete destruction, blew all the antennas and everything down. Uh, there were three sites that fired on us, and they got all three sites. Besides the little mini victory that we just had, there was a big victory that occurred at that moment. Because up to that time, over North Vietnam, the SA-2 missile was top predator. It owned the skies. We could only operate with their permission. And if they didn't want us to be there up to that point, they could shoot us down. It was just that simple. So now we know that our system works and and that we were able to wipe out the missile. So at, at that moment in time, the top predator became our air wing and our airplanes. And now the missile sites had to watch out for us. And it may not seem like a big thing, uh, but psychologically it was an incredible victory because now we would go hunt them instead of them hunting us. Now, hunting them never was fun. It never got to be fun, but we could do it. And, and that was an, that was important. Now, at the same time, we're developing what I call the stick and throttle approach to missile avoidance. Uh, the guys on the ship, and, and remember in those days there were no computers, so there were no such thing as nerds. Uh, there were twidgets, and a twidget was a guy that worked with radios, because that was the most sophisticated thing we had in those days was a transistor radio. Well, a transistor radio uh, tuned to the right frequency, when a radar antenna sweeps it with a signal, will generate static. And so it's a fairly simple matter, if you understand these things, to tune a little transistor radio to the wavelength of 
the SA-2 radar. So when SA-2 radar swept it, it would make a noise. And now the next thing you do is put a directional antenna on that radio. And so now they can adjust the antenna so when they hear the they can adjust the antenna to increase or decrease the intensity of the signal. And now with this directional antenna, we can get a direction beam of where the missile hit radar is. I promise you, this is the truth. Rubber suction cup on a helmet, rabbit ears, about 10 inch on a side for a directional antenna. We had two of these systems on the ship. Transistor radio duct tape to the flash screen in front and duct tape well because on the catch shot if you didn't have a duct tape, it would be in your lap. We'd go hunting SAMs with this technology. And, and one thing about flying in areas where you're going to get shot at a lot, you don't want to fly in trail. If, if you get in a trail formation with airplanes stacked one behind the other, the first guy wakes the gunner up, the second guy gets shot down. So you don't want to ever be the second guy. So whenever we flew formations over the north where we were going to get shot at a lot, which was always, we'd fly line abreast. And those of you who have flown realize that a 15 or 16 airplane formation line abreast is a trick to maintain just because it's hard. So we'd be down at this end and I'd look six airplanes up, which would be 50 yards or so, and I could see the, the uh, helmet of the guy that had this cute little antenna on his head, I could see him sweeping, looking for a signal. You, you could see him kind of, when he'd make a point like this, and the whole formation would turn. And we, we could all see that signal because we're line abreast, and then we'd kind of maneuver to get this big formation turned. Then he'd try to fine tune it a little bit, and then he'd give one more signal, and if he'd give a real aggressive signal, that means, okay, <coughs> this is the one, that's the heading, arm in charge, arm your missiles, arm your weapons, we're going in. And we'd go roaring in, and we'd see all the missiles sitting there on their rails, uh, but they wouldn't shoot them because they know that we're coming and, and just make it worse if they shoot them. You know for sure where they were. So now we go in with our snake eyes, these weapons, and lay them down and, and destroy the missiles. The system worked great. Uh, at the same time that we've got this little system going with the radar thing. The people back in the engineering section of the U.S. Uh, are building uh, more sophisticated devices with a little gauge that's going to go in the cockpit, a scope that would give us strength and direction in the cockpit of the radar, of the enemy radar. And, I, and, and we never saw it, so I, I, I'm kind of guessing, but I think there was a, a selection where you could select different types of radar that it would, it would focus on. And there was no room in the airplane to put it. Uh, so they had to shoehorn the shoehorn system in. So thus its name, shoehorn was the name of the system. <coughs> when you go out and see this airplane out there, 202, look at the intake ducts uh, on both sides. You'll see a funny looking bump. Looks kind of like somebody uh, fiberglassed a banana on the outside of the, the intake duct. Uh, that's part of a shoehorn system wouldn't fit in the airplane, so they stuck it outside of the airplane. And there's the same kind of antenna on the tail, and that antenna would pick up radar signals from various radars, and then give the pilot a signal in the cockpit uh, that he's being looked at by radar, and then if the missile locks on him, it tells him that the missile is locked on him. Now, of course, these systems are incredibly sophisticated now, and they can tell you the type of radar, how far away it is, whether it's on an airplane, another airplane, or and what kind of weapon system it is. Uh, and they're wonderful systems. I've flown them in the simulators, and they're fun to play with uh, in real life, and I wish we had something like that back then. We didn't. Um, so that sort of shows you how the, the, the movement, the things we learned from me being shot down, how we use those in, in combat and put them to great use. Uh, the uh, Another thing that was going on at, at the same time uh, when we were heading north uh, happened back in, in July of the next year, and this is where my second shoot down occurs. And, and we didn't 
we didn't learn much from my second shoot down, but we used some learning from other shoot downs to facilitate my rescue. It went something like this. We were gonna take about 20 airplanes into a target north of Hanoi. I think most of you folks are old enough to know about Vietnam. North of Hanoi, uh, and uh, Hanoi is their major city, and the area we were going was heavily defended, and the odds of us getting back without somebody getting shot down was zero, and we all knew that. So during the brief, uh, Gordy Smith, who was in charge of the group of airplanes that was designed to try to help rescue anyone who was shot down, said, okay guys, here's the plan. Even though you're going into the toughest defended area that we've got, this ridge line that runs up between Haiphong and Hanoi, there's a ridge line that's fairly steep and if, we, if you can put yourself on the north side of the ridge, you'll shield you from all the guns that are on this heavy population center on the other side of these mountains. So the guns won't be able to come to bear on you because the mountains will shield you. So just try to put yourself somewhere on this ridge. And if you do that, I promise you, I'll try to come get you. Thank you, Gordy Smith. If something happens to us, we'll try that. I'm glad I was. So we're on this, on this raid, and uh, uh, Megan comes out to, to play a little bit, and my leader and I uh, try to run him down. And in, in, in retrospect, he probably was a decoy trying to drag me over uh, this heavily defended area, but we can't be sure, but that's, that's a good chance. So anyway, we're I him about five miles, and fighter pilots tend to kind of look at nothing else except to make when they're chasing one. We're about 500 feet, doing about 500 knots. And as I head this, toward this little village, I'm about a quarter mile away, and I see the rooftops of this village all floppy. And over in the corner of a guy standing in what looks kind of like a lifeguard tower, and he's waving this flag. I alternately think it was yellow or red. I'm not sure which color it was. Long time. But anyway, it was a brightly colored flag. They did this a lot. They used this to send signals when airplanes were coming. They could send a signal with just flags, no electronics, you know, across the country in just a matter of seconds. Uh, they could travel because these posts were about every mile or so. And they just, if someone's coming, they'd wave a flag. And they wouldn't get out any signal, no radio transmission. This guy was telling all these guys that there's an airplane coming, and, and as I approached it, all the guns are just turned on. There's no uh, aiming in these type of traps. They just, guns point straight up, and they're just designed to fill an area full of bullets. And as I flew over the top with all these flashing gun barrels, it was like flying through a hailstorm, just like that. Well. There's still a MIG out there five miles out, so so I'm not deterred yet. Uh, so we continue in pursuit of him. And as you maneuver with fighters, you tend to cross behind one another, uh, sort of the tactic that we use. So as he, my wingman flew behind me, he, my call sign then was Bolt. Bolt, are you in burner? When the F-8 and afterburner fire sticks out the back of the gun, 20 feet. I was not an afterburner, but I had the fire sticking out the back there. So he says, well, then you're on fire. Okay, thank you very much. So I turn and head for the water. Just like before, all those funny lights come on, the flash warning light comes on, all the gauges start doing funny things. Rear view mirror shows fire back there. So I know I'm not going to last very long. So I turn and head towards the water. It's about 50 miles. Well, I end up at 50 miles, so it's about 55 miles away. And the airplane is deteriorating rapidly. I did the same trick this time before. I pull a face curtain out about halfway, uh, and so I can keep control of the airplane and still have a face curtain in my hand if something happens. And I'm in a fairly populated area, I can see villages and people down here, so I don't want to jump out now. So I hold on until I'm just about to go into the trees. Uh, it's, it's starting to get fairly heavy wood, and I pop out of the airplane make about two swings, and I'm on the ground. A lot of the trees over there are 
more than 100 feet tall, and it's always a worry when you jump out that your chute's going to catch in a tree, and then you'll be stuck hanging in your tree looking like a Christmas tree ornament, and then the bad guys come by and, at best case, cut you down and make you a prisoner, and worst case, shoot you. So uh, the idea of being hanging in a tree was not a pleasant thought. Worked out fine. My toes are just brushing the ground. I unhook. I got on my mind. Well, not good. This is not English I'm hearing. <laughs> uh, it was a uh, loudspeaker system. Uh, I, I, I always said uh, like a sound powered phone kind of thing, like a megaphone. But anyway, someone was talking on it. Thing. And obviously, urging the people on and let's go find this Yankee air pirate and beat him up. Or whatever. So I run uh, away from the sound. Gordy Smith, who has got this briefing for us, that briefed the rescue. Uh, and part of the brief was to set up a fake rescue a couple miles away from the actual pilot. So about three or four miles away, they started orbiting in a racetrack pattern like they would normally do around a down pilot. And my job was not to make any radio transmissions, not to tell them where I was. Somebody probably saw me land where I was, but when they set up the rescue, they would, you'd expect, and they probably did think, that, well, the pilot must be over there, because that's where the rescue is going to occur. And, the, and then my brief was that whenever this one particular type of airplane came by, and it's an A-1 Sky Raider, an airplane that actually saw world service in World War II, besides Korea, and, and they've got a beautiful sample of one in the museum, a big, solid rock of an airplane. You can empty a couple AK-47s in it, and all you do is scratch paint. This is not a fragile airplane. So, and they're great for rescue type stuff, because we can get down dirty. So, uh, when, whenever the SPAD, we call them, we call them SPADs, came on my side of the circle, my brief was to click the mic once. And every time they came around, I clicked. And the, the guy who was driving that airplane would make ever wider circles click wider, if you closer, click to me. And then when he flew right over me, click, click. So I have clicked the mic a couple times, but it made no transmissions, not enough to alert anybody to my presence. And I just told them where I was. Gordy Smith invented this. This was not an accident. This guy was a smart, smart guy. Simple, but it worked. So now they know where I am. They got this they're dropping ordnance over here and dropping bombs and like they're softening the area up for rescue. I can hear the helo being vectored in on the, because I can hear the radio, my radio. And the radios we had didn't have uh, volume on. So whenever they'd say something radio, I'd hide it because I was afraid they could hear my radio. So I wished I could turn the darn thing down or off, but I couldn't. So when the helo finally shows up, it's about an hour later, we're a long ways from friendly territory. So he comes in and heads to the center of the circle. And when I see him, my brief is now when he's near the center of the circle, come up in plain language and just, this is gonna be a sprint to get you out. Told him to turn left, straight ahead, drop the sling. And he came over towards me, dropped the sling. Now, 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 down came the sling. I, it's a cute little device. You kind of jump in, one leg drops pins under here, then you wrap a strap around you and you grab a hold of it. Uh, the crew guys in the helicopter are busy shooting their M60 machine guns. They have, they don't, they're not going to mess with the sling. They're busy. They're engaging these, the bad guys. Uh, I can hear them coming up through the bushes as the helo is getting ready to lift me up. I can see them coming up. I can see them. I can hear them. I got my pistol out pointed, ready to do whatever I have to do to the first guy, if I think. You know, if I thought they were going to capture me. I was going to be the most docile, nicest guy they've ever met. But now that I'm in the sling, okay, I'm going to shoot the first guy I see. you got to change you know, change the plans here now. They're going to get me out. The, the helo driver was at max altitude and low to the helicopter. And guys who've flown helicopters understand this, and I've, I've only ridden it. But he was starting to deteriorate RPM. He, he was starting to lose power slowly slowly settle into the tree. So he allowed the airplane to rotate, uh, I guess it's into the tail rotor, and that reduces the load on the tail rotor and gives us a little more power to the main rotor. 
So he made about two turns like this, and then he says, okay, enough of this. We're going to crash in the trees, and down he goes down the slope. 150 feet of cable I'm on the end of. And down they go through the trees, bouncing me off the trees. I was all wrapped up around this thing as tight as I could. I was getting beat up pretty good, but we're going the right direction. Uh, and go, 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 don't worry about me. They finally uh, have time to reel me in. They pull me inside, and there's so much spent brass on the floor from the M60s that I almost went right back out the door, just slipping and sliding on these rollers. Uh, I sat down in real quick in a corner, and one of the crewmen tossed me a flag vest between pulling the trigger and feeding belts of ammunition in. I started to put the flak vest on, and a round came through the floor, right through the floor, right in front of me. And I went, okay, I'm not going to wear this thing. I think I will sit on it, <laughs> which is what I did. Um, no more rounds came through the floor, by the way. That was the only round that I saw. We, we were shot up quite a bit before the point. It was the only one that I saw. Okay, as we, as we're, it took us about 45 minutes to get out to the water. Okay, as we're going across, we're going out, land and they're maneuvering back and forth and the spads are making dive bombing runs on both sides of this looking very spectacular and quite a view as a matter of fact. Uh, out in front of the helicopter I can see a thick black cloud of exploding flak. I mean just I mean not one or two just a solid wall of flak that seems to stay about 150 feet in front of the helicopter and we never get to it as so we go along this wall of flak moves with us. Well, it took us a while to figure out later what was going on. But the North Vietnamese, in order to aim their anti-aircraft guns, and a lot of their soldiers uh, were essentially rice farmers and didn't know anything about technology or machinery. So they had to simplify some of these things. So on the anti-aircraft guns, they put three rods out from the barrel at angles. And I'm arbitrary guess 15, 25, and 35 degrees or something like that out in front. And then on the, the rod that was the furthest out in front of the barrel, they put a silhouette of a F-105. That was the fastest airplane in North Vietnam. Over the next one, they had a silhouette of an F-8, which was the next fastest airplane in North Vietnam. And then they had a silhouette of an A-4. So if you as a gunner, if you took the silhouette on the end of the rod and matched it to the airplane, so if an F-105 came by, you'd put the 105 on it. That would automatically give you the lead of a typical 105, which was 650 miles an hour, at typical altitude, 2,000 feet, let's say, and would solve your problem in a very cool, simple solution. They didn't have a picture of an SH-3 helicopter on the end of the stick. <laughs> if they did, they would have had it on the, right on the end of the barrel, because there was no lead required. We were doing 105 miles an hour on a good day. Had there been one duck hunter up there, I'd still be there. <laughs> uh, and we just drove all the way out with this wall of flak and cut so It was an amazing sight. But everything worked fine. Uh, we got out. No one else got shot down. And I thank Gordy Smith. And actually, I saw him three years ago in Las Vegas and uh, thanked him a hundred times more. Uh, he finally got himself shot down. And all of us guys who he helped rescue, and there's quite a few of us that owe our lives to him, we're thrilled to have him finally get shot down so we could rescue him. And, and, and Gordy Smith, as only Gordy Smith could do, his airplane, it's a, it's a piston airplane with gas, so his airplane's on fire, burning terribly, and there's no ejection seat on his pad. He tries to go out with a canopy and for some reason he can't get out and he has to go straight up over the back of the airplane. I guess there was too much fire from the, from the exhaust ports. He goes straight back like, and he hits the vertical stabilizer and gets beat up quite a bit and, and took a substantial rescue of a lot of people to get him out of where he was and back. And we were thrilled to be able to finally do something for, for Gordy Smith. He is, as you guess, hero of heroes in our world. And, so that kind of runs the gamut of what it was like to fly one of these F-8s. And, and as Jack Jeffords, who was our maintenance officer, said uh, a while ago, we took 12 airplanes over there and 
came back with 12 airplanes, but a different 12. We had the first 12 airplanes we took all shot down. Uh, uh, actually, 202, you say, how did 202 not get shot down? Well, 202 made a hard landing and broke its main landing gear. So 202 is down in the hangar bay uh, and going to be sent to Japan to get a new landing gear put on it. And, I, I, and then they did that, and then it finally came resurrected as an F. H, is that what it is? J. J. H. J. J. F. A. J. Okay. Uh, which has got, it, it, it had VLC? Yes. Wow. It had some cool fixes on it that made it heavier, which us pure SFA drivers would say anything made it heavy wouldn't be good. But in fact, it, it reduced its landing speed by probably 10 miles an hour. You, you know what that was? 20. 20? Yeah. Which the high landing speed of the F8 was one of the reasons we, we gobbled up so many. Okay, I can't send you away without at least one Blue Angel story, so I have to tell you. In Kaluna, British Columbia, it's a little town, a little beach town, uh, a couple thousand people, uh, resort town. Most of the buildings are just one story, a couple two-story buildings. One is a bank, the, you know, the modern bank with the uh, curtain, you know, steel, glass, and I think very nice. Building. So we're flying a practice show here. The diamond, most people call it a bomber, that's really a Thunderbird term, but essentially they come straight down, split to the four corners of the compass, go out a couple miles, do half Cuban eights, come down and come back scooting across the ground. And the idea is for all four airplanes to cross a common point in four different directions uh, at a zillion miles an hour and do it all at the same time so everyone goes, ah! like that. When in fact, we have it set up so we're a long ways apart. But because of the speeds, you don't notice it. You think they're all going to collide. We're never even close to each other. Well, the F-4 is remarkable in that you can make speed corrections with it in, the, in this microsecond. So if, if you are slow, you can speed up. If you're fast, you can slow down. Uh, if you're behind this crossing and you're supposed to be at the crossing point, you see everybody else is already there. All you got to do is slide the two big throttles forward, click them outboard, and go one, two, three, four. There's four little clicks for four stages of afterburner. And now this airplane is throttled up, and it will go as fast as you want to go. Like that. So our Marine coming in from out at the shore is behind. So he's decided he's going to really get caught up. And you could, you could guess how fast. I mean, it, I'm just guessing. Certainly 750, maybe 800 miles. He was well past the speed of sound. I mean, not even close to the speed of sound. At 100 feet over the rooftops of this little town. Oh, oh we had We had radio uh, ability to turn civilian radios on our airplanes uh, because we needed to do that part of the time. So I was listening to an FM station. Keep it down low so we can still hear the radio. So we hear the announcer on the FM station interrupt this program. There's been a terrible explosion downtown. <laughs> we don't know where. But all emergency personnel, please report to your stations. Uh, whoever has knowledge of where this explosion occurred, please tell us. And the boss says, No maneuver. Okay, guys, who did it? Because we kind of knew. So the boss takes us back, and we land at a remote airfield about 15 miles away, something like that. We get in our cars and drive back. We're in civilian clothes, trying to look at this right. There is not a single piece of glass in that town. Like not one. Not a window, not a door. And this bank, two-story bank, the curtains are blowing like this. The glass is all piled up around the floor. I mean, if, if it wasn't such a mess, it would have been fun. I mean, because it was kind of funny in a very perverted sort of way. Nobody's hurt in this deal. So if any of it had been hurt, you know that uh, I couldn't tell the story. So now this is the practice day. The next day, they expect 20, 25,000 people in town for this festival, Kelowna Lake Day or something like that. So they decide they better board the town up paint the plywood 
with some cute picture. So they have a contest. The newspaper has a contest. You paint all these murals, and then we'll have a contest and give a hundred bucks or whatever to whoever has the coolest mural. And I, to this day, have the front page of their newspaper with the winning entry on it. And I laugh even thinking about it. The winning entry was, if this is what angels do, I don't ever want to meet the devil. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't know who did it. No, they knew we did. Oh, they did. Yeah, but they, yeah, but meaning that Daniel's gonna do this. The devil's got a really good plan. <laughs> they had a hundred thousand people at the festival the next day, and the, oh, and, and the, and the, the festival management sort of tongue in cheek thanked us. <laughs> Biggest crowd we've ever had. Thank you, I think. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, what do you suppose all those 100,000 people thought? We're going to do it again? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. We did it once. The windows are all broken. No sense in doing it again. <laughs> so that's the end of my formal presentation. I, I assume there's going to be a question or two. And please do you go remember ahead. what year that was? Sure, 1969, exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I live in the winter in a little town called Whitefish, Montana, ski resort in Montana. And Kelowna is only about three hours away. And I keep thinking, that, except in the winter, the weather's so crappy. But I keep thinking that I'll drive over there sometime and see if I can find somebody from the town still alive that was there in 1969. And I may still do that. And I don't know if I'll get slugged or laughed at. Or, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that was the first year in the Phantom. So I, so I Well, I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. It's uh, This is a great museum. I'm proud of you guys. A lot of you I know are involved. In helping with the museum and, and uh, volunteers, and you've got a great project here and one of the great <coughs> institutions, and even those of you who are leaving for other jobs today. <laughs> Did you prefer, which one, you prefer the F8 or the F4? F8, no question about it, no question about it. But they're both wonderful airplanes. The F8 felt like it weighed 100 pounds. The F4 felt like it weighed like a safe. What do you think, Alan? Is that a good summary? A couple thousand. What's that? Heavy. Yeah. Very heavy. I mean, air, the Air Force was fun to fly, and it was a rocket, but it was a heavy air, and it just kind of felt heavy. The F-8 just, you know, like a, like a ballet dancer. Yeah, tell me, yeah, she just, you just, you're the star of the show, Maggie, and you just missed it. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Was, it, was the uh, F-4 also carried a base? Yes, yeah, F-4 and F-8, so all, all those airplanes are carrier based. No. I, I flew both of them off the carrier a lot. Because we flew the F-4s off of Canada. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. I didn't. I, yeah. I flew over, I mean, Canada and I understand. <laughs> uh, Marines? What? Marines or what, what service? I don't know. I was Army. I, I passed the yeah, You passed, passed the exam, exam. okay. You, you passed the IQ exam, okay. <laughs> no, I, no, I was army. From Kadena, the Air Force was flying. Oh, the Air Force, Air Force? Okay, the Air Force out of there. Yeah, they didn't obviously fly them off a of carrier. They couldn't. They didn't. Although we had an Air Force exchange pilot with us who came from the Air Force and was perfectly capable of landing on aircraft. He was a wonderful pilot. He did not survive. He's got the best that was the Vietnam Air War. Next number. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, no, stop. You can't leave. We're going to make a drawing here. We filled up the thing. No, you put it in. Put it in. <laughs> Anybody else? Last call? Morning. Okay. James Forrest, Kalamazoo, Michigan. What a deal. You can buy another Alabama. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Um, all the way down to work. Oh, that work. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Well, I'll be here. Yeah, I'll be here. Sure.